All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all for coming down on this very, very special Sunday afternoon. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida. So a note to our internet audience watching at home, if at any time during the presentation you'd like to purchase a copy of the book or the previous books in the trilogy, just call the number on your screen. We'll take care of that for you. We will get it signed, and we will ship it to you wherever you are in the United States free of charge. Uh, for those of you watching overseas, the shipping might be just a little bit more. Than <laughs> well, this afternoon... <laughs> This afternoon, Books and Books is thrilled to welcome back Ms. Deborah Harkness, presenting the highly anticipated third volume of the All Souls trilogy, The Book of Life. Ms. Harkness is a professor of history at the University of Southern California. She has received Fulbright, Guggenheim, and National Humanities Center fellowships. And as you all know, she is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, A Discovery of Witches and A Shadow of Night, Shadow of Night, which introduced the world to the mystery of Ashmole 782. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In this book, Deborah deepens her themes of power and passion, family and caring, and past deeds and their present consequences, as Diana Bishop and Matthew Claremont learn at last what the witches, what the witches discovered so many centuries ago. Please give a very warm welcome to Ms. Deborah Harkness. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for this warm welcome to Miami. Um, it is really a treat to be back here at Books and Books because Books and Books hosted me for one of my very first events. Was there anybody here in 2011 here in Miami? Very few. There were not very many people here because not very many people had heard of this college professor had written a novel. So things have changed a little bit, and Books and Books have been supporting this trilogy from the beginning, so it's so wonderful to be back here in, in Miami and be with you. So first thing, I'm going to start with a quiz. <laughs> How many of you have finished the Book of Life? How many of you have read it twice? <laughs> so there were two. However, as you could see, not every hand went up, but until every hand goes up, I'm going to remind you now, and I'm going to remind you right before the Q&A, no spoilers, okay? We don't want to ruin anybody else's discovery of witches, okay? So that's, that's important. Um, however, it is a book signing, and it would not be much of a signing if I didn't actually read from the book. So for the purists out there, this is the moment where you want to put your headphones in because I am going to read a little bit, nothing past page 36. So it's really early innings in the book, but you know, otherwise we can't really call this a book reading. So, <laughs> so as you know, we've all been following the story of three main characters, Diana Bishop, a reluctant witch and a Yale historian who wants to keep all of her power and her family's magical tradition at arm's length. Matthew Claremont, a 1500 year old geneticist who of course is also a vampire. And the third main character in the All Souls trilogy is really Ashmole 782. This missing manuscript that may be a spell book, that may tell us the secrets of life. It's a book that everybody seems to want, even though nobody knows what's in it. And the last person to have touched this book is Diana Bishop. Matthew's been looking for it, but he hasn't actually had the thing in his hands uh, as of yet. So. This represents the, the final steps in the journey of those three characters. Uh, and it is really a story of many things. People always say to me, what is your book about? I think, how much time do you have? <laughs> um, and you know, you'll see the advertisement, it'll say, a forbidden love. And I guess that's part of it, right? You know, it's a book mystery. That's another part of it. 
I didn't really know this term, honestly, when I started writing, but I guess it's a paranormal romance. I didn't know such a thing existed, because I don't get out much. I'm a professor. Um, and, and, but it's also, to me, it's always been a story of family. And we started out with a very narrow focus. If you think about how a discovery of witches started way back, 1,500 pages ago or whatever, we started with this really narrow beam of light on Diana Bishop herself. We saw the world through her eyes. And then at some point in the book, our focus expanded a little bit. And we saw the world through Matthew's eyes as well as Diana's. And we met their immediate family, Isabel, Sarah, M. We met Marcus. We met their uh, very close friends. Then in Shadow of Night, the world got a lot bigger. If you think about the first book, Diana and Matthew never left set tours the, the house itself, ever. Um, and you know it, what happens in the book of Lo uh, in Shadow of Night is, is that we're suddenly out in the world with them as a couple, and we're meeting their friends and extended family. And the book of life begins right where Shadow of Night left off. Some of my readers, I remember after Discovery of Witches, said, "Well, where are you going to start Shadow of Night?" And I said, "Right where we left off." And they said. Well, no, really, where are you going to start? I said, right where we left off. <laughs> so I'm telling you the truth. We're going to start right where we left off with Book of Life. And when we left off with Book of Life, Diana and Matthew were walking up the driveway to get to set tour. And what they didn't know was, of course, that they were being watched. Because while they've been in 1590 and 1591, back at home, a group have been gathering in that ancient castle. And that group has gone through its own challenges. And now, they didn't know if Diana and Matthew were ever coming back. Think about that for a minute. They went day to day without knowing if they were ever going to see these people again. But they also know that they've got some pretty bad news to share with this couple. It may not be the homecoming they were expecting. So we're go I'm going to read you the first few pages of the Book of Life. Hopefully this means if you haven't started the book, when you do, you're going to hear my voice in your head um, when you're reading. And we're going to take up our perspective, again, in that wide circle of friends and family with two creatures, uh, Emily Mather and Philippe, who are watching as Matthew approaches. And with Diana. He's not leaving her anywhere, obviously. All right. Ghosts didn't have much substance. All they were composed of was memories and heart. Atop one of Set Tour's round towers, Emily Mather pressed a diaphanous hand against the spot in the center of her chest that even now was heavy with dread. Does it ever get easier? Her voice, like the rest of her, was almost per imperceptible. The watching, the waiting, the knowing, not that I've noticed, Philippe de Claremont replied shortly. He was perched nearby, studying his own transparent fingers. Of all the things Philippe disliked about being dead, the inability to touch his wife Isabeau, his lack of smell or taste, the fact that he had no muscles for a good sparring match, invisibility topped the list. It was a constant reminder of how inconsequential he had become. Emily's face fell, and Philippe silently cursed himself. Since she died, the witch had been his constant companion, cutting his loneliness in two. What was he thinking, barking at her as if she were a servant? Perhaps it will be easier when they don't need us anymore, Philippe said in a gentler tone. He might be the most experienced ghost, but it was Emily who understood the metaphysics of their situation. What the witch had told him went against everything Philippe believed about the afterworld. He thought the living saw the dead because they needed something from them. Assistance, forgiveness, retribution. Emily insisted these were nothing more than human myths, and it was only when the living moved on and let go that the dead could appear to them. This information made Isabeau's failure to notice him somewhat easier to bear, but not much. I can't wait to see Em's reaction. She's going to be so surprised. 
Diana's warm alto floated up to the battlements. Diana and Matthew, Emily and Philippe said in unison, peering down to the cobbled courtyard that surrounded the chateau. There, Philippe said, pointing at the drive. Even dead, he had vampire sight that was sharper than any human's. He was also still handsomer than any man had a right to be, with his broad shoulders and devilish grin. He turned the ladder on Emily, who couldn't help grinning back. They're a fine couple, are they not? Look at how much my son has changed. Vampires weren't supposed to be altered by the passing of time, and therefore Emily expected to see the same black hair, so dark it glinted blue, the same mutable gray-green eyes, cool and remote as a winter sea, the same pale skin and wide mouth. There were a few subtle differences, though, as Philippe suggested. Matthew's hair was shorter, and he had a beard that made him look even more dangerous, like a pirate. She gasped. Is Matthew bigger? He is. I fattened him up when he and Diana were here in 1590. <laughs> Books were making him soft. Matthew needed to fight more and read less. Philippe had always contended there was such a thing as too much education. Matthew was living proof of it. <laughs> Diana looks different too, more like her mother with that long coppery hair, Em said, acknowledging the most obvious change in her niece. Diana stumbled on a cobblestone, and Matthew's hand shot out to steady her. Once Emily had seen Matthew's incessant hovering as a sign of vampire overprotectiveness, now with the perspicacity of a ghost, she realized that this tendency stemmed from his preternatural awareness of every change in Diana's expression, every shift in her mood, every sign of fatigue or hunger. Today, however, Matthew's attention seemed even more focused and acute. It's not just Diana's hair that has changed. Philippe's face had the look of wonder on it. Diana is with child, Matthew's child. Emily examined her niece more carefully, using the enhanced grasp of truth that death afforded. Philippe was right, in part. You mean with children. Diana is having twins. Twins, Philippe said in an awed voice. He looked away, distracted by the appearance of his wife. Look, here are Isabeau and Sarah with Sophie and Margaret. What will happen now, Philippe, Emily asked, her heart growing heavier with anticipation. Endings, beginnings, Philippe said with deliberate vagueness, change. Diana has never liked change, Emily said. That is because Diana is afraid of what she must become, Philippe replied. So just as we've panned out to include family and friends and all manner of supernatural creatures and preternatural creatures, vampires, witches, demons, fire drakes, ghosts, you name it. Um, we have also come to learn a little bit more about the de Clermont family, about the customs of vampires and witches, and all of those things are going to be, come handy as we go through this uh, tale that unfolds in the Book of Life. And as the book proceeds in the first chapter, you see Diana and Matthew's arrival through the eyes of many different characters, all of the different characters who are assembled there. And just as we've been getting more and more wide lens uh, in, our, in our treatment so far, in the first three chapters we go from everyone in the chateau to Matthew's experience to Diana's experience. So the next thing I want to read to you is from chapter two, because of course Matthew is protecting Diana after she hears the devastating news of Emily's death, where we left off at the end of chapter two, uh, of, of uh, book two, I'm sorry. And so in chapter two, Matthew is letting Diana sleep and he is using those hours between midnight and dawn to prowl around set tour and to have his own private conversations with some of the people that he's left behind. And some of those people, he ha is seeing in a whole new way because he's just been back in 1590 with them. And one of those characters is, of course, his nephew, Gallo Glass. 
So I'm going to read to you a little bit of lightly edited chapter two. <laughs> Matthew raced down the curbing stone staircase that wound between his tower rooms at Set Tour and the main floor of the chateau. He avoided the slippery spot on the 30th tread and the rough patch on the 17th where Baldwin's sword had bashed the edge during one of their arguments. Matthew had built the tower addition as his private refuge, a place apart from the relentless busyness that always surrounded Philippe and Isabel. Vampire families were large and noisy, with two or more bloodlines coming uncomfortably together and trying to live as one happy pack. This seldom happened with predators, even those who walked on two legs and lived in fine houses. As a result, Matthew's tower was designed primarily for defense. It had no doors to muffle a vampire's stealthy approach and no way out except for the way you came in. His careful arrangements spoke volumes about his relationships with his brothers and sisters. Gallo Glass was crooning a sea shanty in the Chateau's Great Hall. For reasons Matthew couldn't fathom, every other verse was punctuated by expletives and ultimatums. <laughs> After a moment of indecision, Matthew's curiosity won out. Bloody fire, Drake. Gallo Glass had one of the pikes down from the cache of weapons by the entrance and was waving it slowly in the air. Farewell and adieu to you ladies of Spain. Get your arse down here or Granny will poach you in white wine and feed you to the dogs. <laughs> For we've received orders to sail for Old England. What are you thinking flying around the house like a demented parakeet? <laughs> and we may never see you fair ladies again. What the hell are you doing, Matthew demanded. Trying to catch your wife's wee beastie, of course. Gallo Glass made a sudden upward thrust with his pike. There was a shriek of surprise, followed by a hail of pale green scales that shattered like isinglass when they hit the floor. The blonde hair on Gallo Glass's forearm shimmered with their iridescent green dust. He sneezed. Cora, Diana's fire drake familiar, was clinging to the minstrel's gallery with her talons, chattering madly and clacking her tongue. She waved hello to Matthew with her barbed <laughs> tail, piercing a priceless tapestry depicting a unicorn in a garden. <laughs> Matthew winced. I had her cornered in the chapel up by the altar, but Cora is a cunning lass, Gallo Glass said with a touch of pride. She was hiding atop Grandad's tomb, her wings spread wide. I mistook her for an effigy. Now look at her. Up in the rafters, vainglorious as the devil, and twice as much trouble. Why, she's put her tail through one of Isabeau's favorite draperies. Granny is gonna have a stroke. If Cora is anything like her mistress, Cornering her will not end well, Matthew said mildly. <laughs> Try reasoning with her instead. Oh, aye, that works very well with Auntie Diana. <laughs> Gallo Glass sniffed. Whatever possessed you to let Cora out of your sight? The more active the fire drake is, the calmer Diana seems, Matthew explained. Perhaps, but Cora's hell on the decor. She broke one of Granny Sevres vases this afternoon. Oh, so long as it wasn't one of the blue ones with the lion heads that Philippe gave her, I wouldn't worry. Matthew groaned when he saw Gallo Glass's expression. <laughs> Mared. <laughs> that was a lens response, too, Gallo Glass said, leaning on his pike. Well, Isabel will have to make do with one less piece of pottery, Matthew said. Cora may be a nuisance, but Diana is sleeping soundly for the first time since we came home. Oh, well, that's all right then. Just tell Isabeau that Cora's clumsiness is good for the grandbabies. Granny will hand over her vases as sacrificial offerings. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'll try to keep the flying termagen entertained so Auntie can sleep. How are you going to do that? Matthew asked with skepticism. Sing to her, of course. Gallo Glass looked up. Cora cooed at his renewed attention, stretching her wings a bit farther so they caught the light from the torches stuck into brackets along the walls. Taking this as an encouraging sign, Gallo Glass drew a deep breath and began another booming ballad. My head turns round, I'm in a flame, I love like any dragon. Say, would you know my mistress's name? Cora clacked her teeth in approval. 
Gallowglass grinned and began to move the pike like a metronome. He waggled his eyebrows at Matthew before singing the next lines. <laughs> I sent her trinkets without end, gems, pearls to make her civil, till having nothing more to send, I sent her to the devil. <laughs> Good luck, Matthew murmured, sincerely hoping that Cora didn't understand the lyrics. <laughs> So it's in chapter three that we finally see the world again through Diana's eyes. It's in chapter three that she emerges from her cocoon of grief. And we might wonder, what makes Diana emerge from Matthew's tower apartments uh, and come out to face the day? Because after all, Diana is not the same witch who left in October. She is a very different person, and when she comes out of that tower room, she comes out swinging, and there's an excellent reason for that, and his name is Baldwin de Clermont. <laughs> the de Clermont family library was bathed in a gentle pre-dawn light that made everything in it appear in soft focus. The edges of the books, the strong lines of the wooden bookcases that lined the room, the warm golden and blue hues of the Aubusson rug, what it couldn't blunt was my anger. For three days, I had thought that nothing could displace my grief over Emily's death, but three minutes in Baldwin's company had proved me wrong. Come in, Diana. Baldwin sat in a throne-like Savonarola chair by the tall windows. His burnished red-gold hair gleamed in the lamplight, its color reminding me of the feathers on Augusta, the eagle that Emperor Rudolph hunted with in Prague. <laughs> Every inch of Baldwin's muscular frame was taut with anger and banked strength. I looked around the room. We were not the only ones to have been summoned to Baldwin's impromptu meeting. Waiting by the fireplace was a waif of a young woman with skim, uh, skin the color of skim milk and black, spiky hair. Her eyes were deep gray and enormous, fringed with thick lashes. She sniffed the air as if scenting a storm. Varen, Matthew said. He had warned me about Philippe's daughters, who were so terrifying that the family asked him to stop making them. <laughs> but she didn't look very frightening. Varen's face was smooth and serene, her posture easy, and her eyes sparkled with energy and intelligence. Were it not for her unrelieved black clothing, you might mistake her for an elf. Then I noticed a knife hilt peeking out from her high-heeled black boots. Wolfling, Varen replied to Matthew. It was a cold greeting for a sister to give her brother, but the look she gave me was even more frigid. Witch. It's Diana, I said, my anger flaring. I told you there was no way to mistake it, Varen said, turning to Baldwin without acknowledging my reply. Why are you here, Baldwin, Matthew asked. I wasn't aware I needed an invitation to come to my father's house, he replied. But as it happens, I came from Venice to see Marcus. The eyes of the two men locked. Imagine my surprise at finding you here, Baldwin continued nor did I expect to discover that your mate is now my sister. Philippe died in 1945, so how is it that I can feel my father's blood vow, smell it, hear it? Someone else will catch you up on the news, Matthew said, taking me by the hand. Neither of you is leaving my sight until I find out how that witch tricked a blood vow from a dead vampire. Baldwin's voice was low with menace. It was no trick, I said indignantly. Was it necromancy then, some foul resurrection spell, Baldwin asked, or did you conjure his spirit and force him to give you his vow? What happened between me and Philippe had nothing to do with my magic and everything to do with his generosity, I said. You make it sound as though you knew him, Baldwin replied. That's impossible, not for a time walker. Diana and I have been in the past, Matthew explained, in 1590 to be exact. We were here at Set Tour just before Christmas. You saw Philippe, Baldwin asked? We did, Matthew, was, uh, Matthew said. Philippe was alone that winter. 
You were here in the winter, in December? That means we have to endure five more months of Philippe's blood song, Varen muttered, her fingers pinching the bridge of her nose as though her head ached. I frowned. Why five months? According to our legends, a vampire's blood vow sings for a year and a day. All vampires can hear it, but the song is particularly loud and clear to those who carry Philippe's blood in their veins, Baldwin said. Philippe said he had wanted there to be no doubt I was a de Clermont. I looked up at Matthew. This meant all the vampires who had met me in the 16th century must have heard Philippe's blood song and known I was not only Matthew's mate, but also Philippe de Clermont's daughter. Philippe had been protecting me during every step of our journey in the past. No witch will ever be recognized as a de Clermont. Baldwin's voice was flat and final. I already am. I held up my left hand so he could see my wedding ring. Matthew and I are married as well as mated. Your father hosted the ceremony. If San Lucien's parish registers survive, you'll find our wedding took place on the 7th of December, 1590. What we will likely find should we go to the village is that a single page has been torn out of the priest's book, Farron said under her breath. Father always covered his tracks. Whether you and Matthew are married is of no consequence, for Matthew is not a true de Clermont either, Baldwin said coldly. He is merely the child of my father's mate. So, that's page 36. <laughs> So just like in Shadow, already Matthew and Diana's lovely dreams and plans have been kind of all thrown out the window um, by all of those who surround them. And I started by saying a lot of people ask me what these books are about, and, and uh, they have lots of ideas, and of course I have lots of ideas, but that one of the things it's really about is family. And it's about a kind of family that is the kind of family my parents raised me to understand, which is that a family is based not solely on blood, but also on love and compassion and caring and mutual responsibility. And that's always, that is a traditional family. It really is, all the way back through time. And so Diana and Matthew are in the midst of a challenge, but it's a challenge that if they succeed, if they find the Book of Life, if they find out what secrets it contains, and they manage to do it with the support and the help of the friends and family that they have, is going to result in the kind of family that can withstand any challenges. And that is what makes for lasting relationships. Love, compassion, caring, mutual responsibility. So on that note, I'm going to turn the floor over to you to your questions. We have time for a Q&A. And again, I want to thank all of you who came early so I could sign your books beforehand because I've got a, a plane to catch, believe it or not. But I will still have time after the Q&A to sign any books for those of you who had came in later. So not to worry. And thanks again for all of you for coming out to support your local bookstore, Books and Books. Um, we really appreciate it because, you know, this is really where the magic happens. It's right here. So anyway, thank you. So who wants to, oh gosh, put their <laughs> hands up. Okay, first of all, you've all done the reading. So I'm that's right there, I'm really impressed with my class. Then I have questions. Yes, ma'am, in the. I, yes, um, I'd like to know, I'm sure you've answered this question before, but how and when did you come up with the idea for this book? And um, I, I'm interested in what made you choose this particular subject matter? Okay, uh, I'm gonna actually do a reminder, and then I'm going to repeat the question. So the reminder again is no spoilers for the Book of Life, okay? So no questions about the plot. If you have a plot question, you can ask me after, after we're done in a very soft voice. Um, and the question here is how did I come up with this idea? Well, it really was an accident. I had no plans to be a writer, no plans to write a novel. If you had asked me in 2007, I would have bet you my house that I would never write a novel. Um, but in 2008, I was traveling in Mexico with my family in celebration of my mom's birthday. 
and I went through an airport bookstore that had literally an entire wall of books that were about witches, werewolves, vampires, demons, shapeshifters, elves, fall, fallen angels, rising angels. It, it went the whole spectrum. <laughs> And it looked like they were getting a fair amount of romantic action, if you knew what I mean, <laughs> from the covers. And I looked at that wall and I thought, that is so, you know, I, like I said, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time in live, a lot more time in libraries than in bookstores and, and certainly in airports. And so I was stunned by this because I thought, what happened? Because that set of books represents my research subject's 16th century favorite topics of interest. They were obsessed with the supernatural in the 16th century. And I, but we don't normally think we have all that much in common with people in the 16th century. And in the 16th century, their whole worldview supported a view where the supernatural and the natural coexisted with each other seamlessly. So that your next door neighbor really could be dealing with magical supernatural powers because they were kind of everywhere and you just had to know how to tap into them. But our worldview doesn't really support that quite as much anymore. So I started trying to warp and twist things so that I really am, tried to imagine if there really are these creatures, what would have to happen both to their legends and to our understanding of them to enable them to be real? And I started with really practical questions. How do you date if you're a vampire? You know, how, where do you work? Um, how come your neighbors don't know that you're a vampire? Because I would know if somebody next to me only went out at night and had fangs, just <laughs> FYI. And so that's why my vampires and witches and demons are not like everybody else's, because they had to be so believable that when you go to the movies next time, you can look at the person next to you at the popcorn stand and think, demon. <laughs> and that's how we got started. So from that wonderful, wonderful accident. Great question, Hannah Lee. When you started writing the books and you used all these creatures as your subject matter, did you also have in mind the family concept that you just described to us in the group and develop that thing? So Hannah's question is about whether or not, along with having all of these four different kinds of creatures, humans, demons, vampires, and witches, did I also know from the beginning that it was about a, a broader um, sort of concept of family? Absolutely. Um, I was living in California at, at the time, and we were in fall of 2008, we were in the middle of the Prop 8 debates. So there was a lot of talk about what made up a family. And there was a lot of talk about sort of traditional families. And as a historian, traditional families in the past tended to be like, you know, 36 people living in the same building and, you know, all kinds of people in there. And so it just seemed to me that, you know, it was kind of fun to think about, you know, a real traditional family. And of course, with a vampire, you can do that. Because um, my vampire is, you know, very old and so has lived through a lot of different changes to the family and how families are arranged and so that became a really important part of the story to me again right from the beginning great question yes ma'am so in your book vampires have a very heightened sense of smell to mm -hmm. the point where they can change uh, smell the changes in people's emotion do you feel like they can sense the, the difference between someone loving someone and someone being in love with someone Great question. I have to, all right, so the question is, vamp <laughs> I'm gonna repeat the question while I think about it. Um, the question is about vampires, and it's about you know their heightened senses, and whether or not they can tell the difference between whether someone is in love with them or just, loves. just loves them. Um, and I think they can. I think that, you know, love is a very chemical thing. It truly is. And uh, I know that there's a, a chef, at least, in the room. And, and you know, our, our, we take in a lot more information than we really know how to process. And one of the things that I wanted to do with vampires was I studied wolves a lot and wolf behavior in order to write my vampire characters. And so I, one of the things was, of course, that, you know, wolves have this incredibly keen sense of smell and they can you know now they're doing all kinds of research into what wolves and dogs can sense about sickness and things so I think yeah I think you can tell the difference um, and, and I think that uh, yeah they would know okay. perfect yes ma'am um, on your website you have a video um, when you 
came, first came out with Discovery of Witches, you did an interview with Nancy Pearl. Mm -hmm. And in that interview, you said that at the time you had written the first chapter of Discovery of Witches and the last chapter of your third book. Mm -hmm. Is that still true? And did you know the whole story at that time? Did you know all three books, like the gist of them? However, we, we in the group have seen your, your <laughs> outlines on, the, on Facebook and all that, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, did you know your entire story in the very beginning? So the question is, did I know the whole story? Because I had said in an earlier interview that I wrote the first chapter and the last chapter. And I did know the gist of the story. I knew where we began, and I knew where we ended, and I knew where we were midway. Uh, but I didn't know, and I said at the time, I don't know exactly what route we're taking. It's a bit, so I think of, you know, I am not actually a big outliner. It's terrible. I know as a professor I should be. But I always saw this more as a journey. It was like a road trip, you know. So imagine we're in Miami and we're going to Portland, Oregon. And we know we're going to Portland, Oregon, and we know there will be a stop in Chicago. But we don't really know every exit we're going to take, where we're going to stop for gas, all that kind of good stuff. So that's kind of how I wrote the books. And it's a really good thing that that's the case because I never had any plan for Hamish to be in the books. Totally surprised me. I remember to this day, I came out of my office and I said, Matthew's in a car, he's driving. And then I went back in and, you know, and I thought, okay, I have no idea where we're going. Let's see. Um, <laughs> And the same thing, the same thing happened with Gallo Glass. And he takes up a fair amount of space. So any plan that I did have had to be changed in book three to accommodate the rather massive presence that is Gallo Glass. Um, because he, I literally, I remember again that night where I was, you know, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> the door blew open. And then suddenly there was Gallo Glass and Hancock. I thought, Oh my, who invited you to our party? <laughs> so we want those unexpected things to happen, a little bit at least, anyway. I saw a hand up in the back, yes. I got hooked into the books when, right at the start, when you started describing um, all these scientific principles and all these historic figures, they just totally came alive for me. And I felt like you knew them, that you had been there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I know that you studied alchemy and, and therefore you do understand all these formulas and things. How did you ever get into that field of study? Great question. So the question is how did I sort of become a historian and a historian of science and oh, yeah. magic more, more particularly? So I've been interested in history since I was a little kid. My mom's British, my dad is American, and we were dragged around to every historical house and battlefield as a child. And it's, do that to your kids. It's like, you can really end well um, if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> history is good. Um, and, and I went to, to college and I had a professor who said, how do you know what you think you know? And that was my introduction to intellectual history. That's why I became a historian of science, because what most interested me was, how do you know what you think you know about how the world works? Is it your senses? Is it because somebody told you because you trust some scientist guy? And I was always interested in the 16th century. It happened since I was a very little kid. So 16th century science kind of collision. And, I, and it means a great deal to me that you felt like it all came alive to you, because that's, you know, that is my job. <laughs> as a professor, um, but also because, you know, I remember the teachers who did that for me. You know, I had uh, my graduate advisor to whom uh, Shadow of Night is actually dedicated. You know, he was somebody who used to have a chocolate bar for lunch every day and he would come to lecture and he'd think, you'd swear he had just had dinner with Henry VIII the night before. Because he'd just lean across the lectern and it, like he had a secret to tell you about it. And it was so great. So it means a lot to me that, that you had that experience. Thank you. Yes. On pursuing other books with some of your characters. <laughs> so the, the the broader question is, what's next? <laughs> um, and and the answer to that is, I have lots of stories to tell you all. But. <laughs> And I it, I some if you've ever seen a dachshund race, 
um, <laughs> where there's like all of these squirming little dachshunds at the start line, and then somebody says go, and they all run in different directions. <laughs> That's kind of how my brain feels right now, in that I've got all of these different stories to tell, and I'm not really sure which is going to make it first. You know, who's the leader of the pack, I don't know. And what I do know is, is that I really need to take a little bit of a break and let my own creative well, kind of the water level rise, because it's been a pretty intense couple of years. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful. but. I do, I'm actually touring, um, promoting the book through the middle of November. I go back into the classroom on January 15th. And uh, when I get out of it on May 1st, I will start, I promise, thinking, okay. no, 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 I understand that. But if you don't hear from me what my plans are until like, you know, after summer break, um, if you could give, it then that don't think I've like, you know, fallen off the face of the earth. It's just that I, I really need a little bit of a rest. So good question. Yes, yeah, we're here. Um, I I really really came alive for me too. I really appreciate um, all the effort and the work and the love and everything that you put into the books. Um, what advice would you give to someone who is wanting to be an author who wants to? I love history also, but I'm more uh, attracted to other areas of history, mm -hmm. like say ancient Egypt, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. ancient times. What advice would you give to me as far as pursuing this type of um, you know, type of thing in the, those eras. Okay. So the question's about advice for writers. Now, are, are you talking about r the writing itself or the research? Or? Um, I, I was thinking more of the research, but actually both. Okay. So here's the thing. It's real, you know, people say to me, how long did it take you to research your books? Since 1982. <laughs> because that's when I went to college, and I just have been immersed in that ever since. And I could never, ever, uh, I, I have the utmost respect now, writing, re, you know, thinking about people who write historical fiction who aren't historians, because I don't know how they do it. I literally don't. I had to look up an embarrassingly large number of things, and I have a PhD in 16th century his history. I would be one of the people you would call if you wanted to write about 16th century history. So, so you know, it's always a process. And, you, and I think that oftentimes there's a lot of focus in historical fiction on things that Really, we get it. We get that there was no running water, you know, in the past. It, we don't need to talk about this. Um, and and so, you know, what I always say to people is, is that history is like in in a book. History and historical data and details is a little bit like tarragon. A little goes a long way. Um, you want you st you're telling a story. So no, I know that all of your research has taken you years to come up with, but you can't actually tell me everything you know. Um, and and I think that's the number one thing that people feel like they just you know every detail is. Uh, it's not. Think to yourself. The question I always ask myself is: If this was set in the present, would I be taking this long to, to describe this table? Then don't. Not unless it actually adds something. So that's what, for what it's worth, that's my advice. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, and this is more from the, from the scholarly point that you kind of brought out for me in reading the books. Did Carl Jung's psychological interpretation of alchemy come into play in the story of Diana and Matthew's metamorphosis and learning about themselves? So, the book? Yeah, so this is a question about did alchemical lore and legends and symbolism inform the plot lines of the story absolutely so what alchemy is is the st is the study is the science of transformation material transformation and spiritual transformation so even in the medieval and early modern period those two things are linked together and what its basic belief is is that everything's organic including metals and so everything grows to a higher state of being so lead literally grows into gold it takes a long time in the earth, and what an alchemist hoped to do was to speed it up in a laboratory. So that, you know, that's why you get turning lead into gold. And that is sort of, and it's about shedding out imperfections and impurities and only keeping the heart of the thing. And that's really what Diana and Matthew are doing, right? So it's all about transformation and change. And of course, I also pulled on other symbols like the wedding and the the children and the hermaphrodite, the chimera, and so it was a. I, I this is what I do all day. So, and the Ouroboros, the 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 snake with its tail in its mouth, 
Um, and the one actually in the end papers, if you open the Book of Life, you'll see it. It's slightly different. It's actually a 17th century image, alchemical, and it is of a snake and a fire drake that are linked together. So, so, yes. Yes, ma'am. No, I am not a fellow of All Souls. If there's anyone watching from All Souls, that I, I wouldn't say no. Um, uh, no, no. All Souls is a very, I, I did it because of, you know, again, like the, uh, I wanted Matthew to be a scholar, but I also thought teaching would be problematic if you were a vampire. Um, and so I made him a research fellow, and that's the Research Fellow Institute or college at Oxford. Uh, and also, um, I wanted it because, and then I thought, well, that, that's really good because, again, part of the purpose of the stories was to talk about difference and empathy and acceptance and all souls just kind of fit it beautifully. And there's a few other reasons as well, um, which you may discover in the Book of Life. So, other questions? Yes, ma'am. I think this may be our, we'll have one or two more, so, yes. I'm, I'm a walking Google. <laughs> let, me, let me have a shot at it. Set tour. So, is that, did I dream this up? In general, I try really hard not to make things up if there's a good thing I can use that's real. So Set Tour is a real castle, it's, but it is not. If you Google Chateau, Set Tour, you don't get the right one. Because, you know, then what would, what would professors do for a living if everything was on Google? Yeah. So um, the one that you will get is a chateau in the Loire, which is beautiful and white and looks like a wedding cake and is not a medieval fortress by any stretch of the imagination, and it's certainly not one in that part of France. So the, 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 sh the, sh the place that is the real set tour is um, it's a place called Chateau Dauphin, and it's in a place called Pont Guibaud, P-O-N-T-G-I-B-A-U-D, and it's in central region, central France, and uh, it is, it is ident it, when you see it, you'll go, Oh, okay. I mean, it, uh, so that is, that is, was my model for set tour. Um, and at once upon a time, it had seven towers. It doesn't have it anymore, but that, hence the name. Well, I adore how you built it up around the century. Yeah, That's yeah. Amazing. Well, yeah. I mean, and you, as you know, I have a houses thing. So, you know, I had to, ha I had to have a good house or two. I saw a hand up. There you go, ma'am. Um, in the first book, when Matthew is talking to Hamish about Diana mm -hmm. in the beginning, mm -hmm. and very perplexed, he talks about her scholarship and about mm -hmm. how she writes about historical figures as if though she knew them and he would know because he knew most of them. And in Shadow of Night, you introduce a lot of historical figures, mm -hmm. which those of us who don't study history have heard about in eighth grade, but otherwise. And it's been a long <laughs> time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so my question is, to what extent? Um, did you write about these figures, Christopher Marlowe, Walter Raleigh, based on what you studied about them? And to what extent did you lend your creative interpretation? And can you give us an example of something that was from, from your creativity versus something that is widely known in the historian world about them? Sure. So the question is about the historical characters and where does the history end and the fiction begin? Much and <laughs> No, that's OK. <laughs> Again, I do this for a living. Um, and, and here's uh, the, the best example I have for you is Matthew Royden. Matthew Royden is a real poet. He's a real 16th century poet. He was a real pain in the neck to me when I was <laughs> writing my master's, dis my master's thesis on George Chapman's poem, The Shadow of Night. Sound familiar? <laughs> um, and and Matthew, the, the poem is dedicated to Matthew Royden. And besides that dedication, we know he was best friends with Philip Sidney. He knew Walter Raleigh, he was a spy for the Queen, he was a friend with Christopher Marlowe, and he uh, hung out with Thomas Harriet and a bunch of scientists. We don't know his birth date, we don't know his death date, we don't know what happened to him after 1591. It's like he just disappeared. That is where history ends and fiction begins. So I knew Matthew Royden was Matthew Claremont 
from the very beginning. Because when I was thinking about what would vampires be like, I thought they'd be like that <laughs> aggravating guy. <laughs> and, you know, sort of fame adjacent, um, but not actually, you know, in the spotlight long enough for me to get a real hold on them. So that's what I tend to do, is I tend to look for the little Swiss cheesy holes, and I fill those um, with, with things that are imagined. So Marlo, you know, what was he like really? We, who knows, you know? Um, I have his works, and I know what people thought of him, and I know when he died, people said, well, you don't know what happened to him, something bad. But <laughs> if you could, and, but you know who would know? That Matthew Royden guy, but he's gone, and we don't know where he went. And I thought, excellent. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so that's how that works. That's how that dynamic works. One more, and I'm going to give it to this gentleman right here. My question was in Shadow of Night. Mm -hmm. You brought up the time anomalies. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to go with the anomalies instead of you know just coming back to some Earth-shattering dystopian <laughs> worlds when they came back? <laughs> so this is about the vexing subject of time travel. <laughs> so for those of you, I did you know I get a lot of mail from people who say you don't use the right you know you you don't understand time travel. It doesn't work that way. And I'm thinking, okay, but actually, no one's done it yet. So we don't really know how it works. Or at least not that we know of. Although there is a store in LA where you can buy time travel supplies. And I'm not kidding. Um, but, uh, but I use something called the multiverse theory of quantum mechanics for my time travel. And what it basically means is that there's multiple infinite possible outcomes for every event. So today when you came here, you probably came to a stop, a stop sign. There's a universe in which you went straight, there's a universe you went right in, and there's a universe that you went left in. And every decision every one of us makes forever kind of exists in a different universe. And so what Diana and Matthew are doing is sort of time hopping. Um, in a way, they're hopping on different streams. You know, Sarah described it as, you know, changing trains, but she's never done it. So, you know, that was her outsider's perspective on this. Um, and the reason I went for the anomalies be was because I think that's really probably how it would really work, that it would be subtle differences in the outcomes. I mean, okay, so you took a left instead of a right. You double back, but you'd still end up somehow back here at the bookstore. Um, and, and that's sort of what I wanted to play with and with those anomalies. It's a great question. Thanks for giving me a chance to talk about time travel. Okay. <laughs> what a great audience. You are a you, I know a little feedback We're in a feedback she loop. Has you were a, she has an aura that I just <laughs> crossed into. All right, folks, I understand that right now we have one of our largest internet audience, uh, audiences that we've had for an author appearance here at Books and Books. So for those of you watching at home, please call the number on your screen, pick up one of Deborah's books. We will have her sign it for you, and we will ship it to wherever you are in the U.S. free of charge. For those of you here in the house, we have all three titles in the All Souls trilogy for sale at each counter. For those of you who came a little later on, she is going to be signing over on the west side of the store. And off she goes. And it has been such a pleasure having Deborah in the store today. Thank you very much. <laughs>